I'll deal with the essential anatomy for Botox facial injections and in this session I will describe the muscles of the face concentrating mainly on muscles of facial expression which we are mainly concerned with and uh, I will discuss the anatomy of wrinkle lines in the face in relation to the muscles involved, preferred sites of injections and possible complications. I will also outline briefly the blood supply and nerve supply of the face. There are two groups of muscles on the face. Muscles of mastication, like this one, the masseter muscle, and these are supplied, motor supply, by the trigeminal nerve, to be specific, the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, which is the only division that carries motor fibers. And the other group of muscles are the muscles of facial expression, which we are mainly concerned with today. These muscles have their motor innervation from the facial nerve which is the seventh cranial nerve. The muscles of mastication are four muscles. This is temporalis muscle which is attached to the temporal fossa and temporal fascia and the fibers they converge and are inserted into the coronoid process of the mandible. The other muscle is the masseter muscle and this muscle extends between the zygomatic arch and the angle and lateral surface of the ramus of the mandible. The two other muscles of mastication are deeply located and they cannot be seen unless the mandible is removed. We are not much concerned about them but just to mention their names uh, this is the medial pterygoid muscle and the other muscle is the lateral pterygoid muscle and as its fibers in this direction and they are attached to the temporomandibular joint, capsule of the temporomandibular joint and the neck of the mandible while the medial pterygoid muscle is attached to the medial side of the angle of the mandible which has been removed now. The muscles of facial expression lie in the subcutaneous tissue and they are part of the paniculus carnosus. This paniculus carnosus is a sheet of muscle fibers that surrounds the body and located in the subcutaneous tissue in many animals like the cow, sheep and horses and it is used to move the skin in those animals and um, like to drive away birds or flies from the skin. In human this paniculus carnosus is restricted to certain areas in the body like on the face and neck and in the scrotum. On the face there is no deep fascia and the muscles are attached to the dermis. They extend from the bone and are attached to the dermis and thus they move the skin and change the facial expression. Variations in the morphology, distribution and activity of the facial muscles of expression account for variations in facial expression. Again, since there is no deep fascia in the face and since the muscles are attached to the skin, then facial lacerations tend to gape like this one and they must be sutured with care to prevent excessive scarring. On the other hand, the absence of the deep fascia and looseness of the superficial fascia enables much of the blood or fluid to accumulate following bruising of the face. The muscles of facial expression which we are much concerned with they constitute functional groups and they form groups around the orifices and act as sphincters and dilators. Probably this is the main function of these muscles and the uh, varying expressions produced on the face are just like side effects of these muscles. So you can see here the orifices of the face like the uh, eye, the nose, the mouth and the ear. There is a sphincter mechanism which is shown in red and a dilator mechanism which is uh, indicated by the blue arrows. I will start with the muscles around the orbit and the muscle is the orbicularis oculi muscle and this is the sphincter mechanism. It has a palpebral part which is located 
in the eyelid. Palpebra or palpebri means eyelid. So this is the palpebral part of the muscle. It arises from the medial palpebral ligament. This is the medial palpebral ligament. And arch across both eyelids anterior to the tarsal plates. I will talk about tarsal plates in a moment. And they interdigitate laterally uh, to form the lateral palpebral raphi. So here is the lateral palpebral raphi where these muscle fibers interdigitate. So this is the palpebral part which is located in the eyelid, palpebri. The second part of the muscle is called the orbital part. And this is the largest part. So this is the orbital part of the muscle. It surrounds the orbit and blends with the frontal belly of occipital frontalis muscle. This is the frontal belly of occipital frontalis muscle blending with it. It arises from the nasal part of the frontal bone. This is the nasal part of the frontal bone here. Anterior lacrimal crest. So this is the anterior lacrimal crest. This is the posterior lacrimal crest. And in between them is the lacrimal fossa. Here is the anterior lacrimal crest and the posterior lacrimal crest. Well, the lacrimal fossa contains the lacrimal sac. The muscle also arises from the frontal process of the maxilla. This is the frontal process of the maxilla. You can see that the muscles, they circumscribe the orbital margin in concentric loops. There is another part of the muscle which is located very deep and this is called the lacrimal part of the muscle. It is a very small part of the muscle and it is attached to the posterior lacrimal crest and to the lacrimal sac. Now this muscle, the orbicularis oculi, it constitutes the sphincter mechanism around the orbit. The palpebral part, this part, palpebral part, closes the eyes gently as in sleeping or blinking. The orbital part here, which is the biggest part, it lowers the eyebrows to shade the eye from bright light. Both parts, if they act together, they will close the eye forcibly as during a dust storm. In normal closing of the eye, the lateral part of the upper eyelid here comes down before the medial part. So if you put your tip of the finger on the lateral canthus of the eye and you blink, you will notice that the upper eyelid moves medially as it moves downward. And this will help spread uh, lacrimal secretion from the lacrimal gland, which is located in the upper lateral part of the orbit, toward the medial side, toward the nose, where the uh, fluid, the lacrimal fluid, is taken up by the lacrimal canaliculi and into the lacrimal sac. Now, so far, about the sphincter mechanism. I will deal with the dilator mechanism. The dilator mechanism is formed of two muscles. The first one is called levator palpebri superioris, this muscle, and this opposes the palpebral part of orbicularis oculi muscle. The other dilator mechanism is provided by the frontalis of occipital frontalis muscle and this opposes the orbital part of orbicularis oculi muscle. Occipital frontalis as the name indicates consists of two parts occipitalis which is located posteriorly and attached to the occipital bone and frontalis which is located anteriorly and in between them there is an aponeurosis. Aponeurosis means a wide flat tendon. So this is the aponeurosis, which is called the gallia aponeurotica or the epicranial aponeurosis. The aponeurosis, it blends laterally with the temporal fascia. This is the temporal fascia here. So it blends laterally with the temporal fascia above the zygomatic arch. And uh, posteriorly, as we said, that the muscle occipitalis is attached to the bone. Frontalis arises from the aponeurosis and inserted into the skin of the eyebrows. This is to show the layers of the scalp. There are five layers in the scalp and these are indicated by the letters that form the word scalp. So the most superficial layer is the skin and then 
we have the uh, connective tissue, which is a dense connective tissue. And then there is the aponeurosis. This is the epicranial aponeurosis. You can see here, uh, these are the fibers of occipitalis muscle arising from the occipital bone and are attached to the epicranial aponeurosis. And the fourth layer, which is the L, stands for loose connective tissue. Of course, this is the region of the loose connective tissue here. It cannot be seen clearly. And then the P stands for the uh, pericranium or periosteum. I will concentrate mainly on this layer of loose connective tissue. This is the, uh, actually, it uh, provides an easy plane of cleavage in injury and a plane in which blood from severed vessels or fluid after infection can spread for a long distance. Posteriorly, bleeding is unable to spread posteriorly because it will be blocked by the attachment of occipitalis muscle. Laterally, the spread is also limited by the zygomatic arch and the attachment of the aponeurosis laterally. Now, the anteriorly, fluid can spread because uh, the aponeurosis give rise to frontalis muscle and frontalis muscle is attached to the skin of the eyebrow. So, the fluid can enter the eyelids and the root of the nose because the frontalis is attached to skin. It is not attached to bone. And this uh, uh, results in the formation of a black eye following a hit over the head. A brief description of the anatomy of the eyelid is important. The eyelid is formed of skin, which is loose skin, and then deep to the skin is the palpebral part of orbicularis oculi muscle. Deep to that is connective tissue. Uh, this is the um, loose connective tissue that is continuous with that of the fourth layer of the skull. And then deep to that is the orbital septum. This is the region of the orbital septum. And this is uh, actually the orbital septum is formed of fibrous tissue that has a wide button hole in it which is called the palpebral fissure and uh, it is thickened at the upper and lower margins to form the superior and inferior tarsal plates. So this is the these are the tarsal plates and uh, thickened at the medial end to form the uh, this is the medial end to form the medial palpebral ligament and laterally to form the lateral palpebral ligament. The tarsal plates are pierced by the fibers of this muscle. This muscle is called levator palpebri superioris muscle. Levator palpebri superioris muscle uh, is the opponent of the palpebral part of orbicularis oculi muscle and uh, deep, the deepest layer here in the eyelid is the palpebral conjunctiva. This is a view of the eyelids from behind and these are the tarsal plates, superior and inferior tarsal plates. Deep to the tarsal plates we can imagine the conjunctiva, the palpebral conjunctiva and it will be reflected to cover the sclera uh, and here in the upper part there will be a fornix, a conjunctival fornix, into which the ducts of the lacrimal gland open. Levator palpebri superioris is an orbital muscle. It's located inside the orbit, but it does not move the eyeball, so it is uh, different from the, uh, those ocular muscles. It is not shown here, but I'm going to draw it. Um, or to draw the outline of this muscle in a moment. It arises from the apex of the orbit, it arises from the roof, and uh, is the most superficial of these muscles. It moves anteriorly, like the, here, and anteriorly it forms an aponeurosis. Uh, there is no more muscle fibers. Here there are muscle fibers, but anteriorly there will be an aponeurosis. I'll try to draw it in white. So there will be an aponeurosis, and this aponeurosis, um, it passes through the upper eyelid, and uh, so part of the muscle is attached to the uh, um, eyelid, uh, 
parts the other part of the muscle is attached to the superior tarsal plate and yet there is another part of the muscle which is attached to the superior conjunctival fornix now this aponeurosis in addition it contains some smooth muscle fibers and these muscle fibers are constitute a muscle which is called Muller's muscle or superior tarsal muscle the smooth part the smooth muscle part is responsible for the wide-eyed stare of a frightened person division of the cervical sympathetic trunk causes light ptosis because of the paralysis of this muscle the Muller's muscle the smooth muscle part of levator palpebri superioris muscle now the striated part of the muscle is supplied by the oculomotor nerve the third cranial nerve now we have to know about this muscle because this muscle is a muscle of the eyelid and it's an opponent of the palpebral part sometimes injections in the orbital part of the muscle might spread into the upper eyelid and cause paralysis of this muscle resulting in ptosis as a complication of facial injection also close to the eye is another muscle that is the corrugator supercilii this muscle arises from the medial end of the superciliary arch here you can see the muscle this is the muscle from the medial end of the superciliary arch passes upwards and laterally to be inserted into the skin superior to the middle of the supraorbital margin and the superciliary arch now this is a deep muscle uh, it is located deep to orbicularis oculi here in this specimen we can see the muscle but in the other specimen we will not be able to see the muscle because the orbicularis oculi muscle fibers are still there this is the orbital part of orbicularis oculi and the muscle is located deep to it it draws the eye eyebrows medially and inferiorly because of its attachment um, it's attached to bone here and to the skin there so because of the attachment it draws the eye eyebrows downwards and medially and is responsible for the vertical wrinkles above the nose which, what we call the glabellar lines the other muscle is the procerus muscle and this is the procerus muscle it has vertical muscle fibers and is inserted into the skin of the inferior forehead between the eyebrows it depresses the medial end of the eyebrow and wrinkles the skin over the dorsum of the nose it's a superficial muscle unlike the corrugator supercilii which is a little bit deep so we can see the muscle here in this specimen and here in the other specimen the procerus muscle needless to say that all these muscles are supplied motor innervation by the facial nerve 